Okay, our study this morning is from Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22. This is Peter's Pentecostal sermon. We started this, started chapter 2 already, and we saw where the disciples were all speaking in tongues and the people around wondering what that was about, some thinking they were drunk, but they're hearing them speak in their own language. And Peter had told us already that this was the fulfillment of a prophecy from Joel chapter 2 of the Holy Spirit being poured out. And so now Peter gets into his sermon, starting in verse 22. This is where he really begins preaching to them instead of just explaining what's happening. Now... Faye, I'm not sure what's going on, but at least, okay, I was going to say on my screen, the, the lesson was blotted out, but now it's good. So let's have a word of prayer. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you that we can come together for the study of your word. And as we open your word this morning and go through this lesson we pray for your guidance help us to understand what it is you're wanting for us to get out of this passage help us that as we do understand it that it draws us closer to you that it will give us a, a greater sense of who you are of your majesty and your love for us so father guide us now and may all that is said and done here bring glory unto you in your name. We pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as I said, we're starting in, in verse 22. But if I can get a couple people to read, let's read verses 22 through 31. So whoever would be willing to read. Verses 22 to 31. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Uh, so Here's Peter, the first sermon that we have that Peter's preaching, and he comes out with quite boldness, professing Christ, professing early, we see the, the same Jesus which you have crucified and slain. Now, think about this in contrast to the last time we saw Peter in a public forum. This was when Christ was being taken to be tried. 
And Peter here, although he had professed, I'll stand with you forever, I'll die for you, I'll whatever. Even if everybody else should desert you, I won't. And here goes Peter as he's being asked, oh, no, I don't know this guy. I've got nothing to do with him. And then even cussing and swearing and, and you know, denying Christ. Now here he is knowing that these very people that he's speaking to could do the same thing to him that they did to Christ. And look how bold he is now. So, and I think the reason for the boldness really is the very message that he's preaching here. The message that he's preaching, we look at it, it is to pronounce Christ as Jesus, as the Christ, as the Messiah. And not only as the Messiah, but that, yes, you killed him. He died, but God has resurrected him. Think of the power that's in that. What this says about Christ, what it says about the Father. Now, keep in mind, you know, nowadays within Christianity, we talk about Christ all the time. And Christ is everything. And we consider him the Almighty. And we consider him within the whole of Christianity. He's God. He's the one who created everything. He's the one who sustains everything. He's the one who does everything. And in Christianity today, we forget completely about the Father. Now, granted, I know not this group, because that's a big part of what our focus is, is the Father. But in mainline Christianity, the Father is all but forgotten. Uh, we, we mention him just to say he sent his son. And many people don't really believe Jesus to be the literal son of the Father, just one way or another, a figurative thing. You know, he, many, he, it's because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and Mary gave birth, therefore Jesus is a son, and that makes the Father the Father. No, we, I know we don't agree with that. We believe he was the Father that he was the father before the incarnation and that also Jesus was the son of God before the incarnation. And so we have a, a different idea and fully believed to be scriptural than what mainline Christianity has. But back at this time, the time that we're looking at here, they believed in God. Well, they called him the Father uh, to a degree. They did call him the Father, but um, they believed in this God. And now it's trying to convince that Jesus is the Son of God and that he was sent as the Messiah. And this is what Peter jumps into right away. Yes, Pastor Stump, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to bring up a concept of thought for this this process. You mentioned about you know the the prior experience of Peter that we see was where he was denying Christ. And of course, in between there, Christ had met with Peter. He had given the assurance uh, that Peter was accepted. He said, you know, go tell my disciples and Peter, for example. The thing that that's interesting is, that no one on the day of Pentecost stood up and said, well, what right do you have to preach? You denied him. No one, no one even dared to say that. And I think that the key the difference between Peter and Judas was that Peter was forgiven. Peter was truly forgiven, and he knew he was forgiven. And he knew that he could stand as Christ's representative. And if we try to present truth, no matter how accurate we have the truth, uh, I, but yet we have sin on our character, uh, God's not going to be able to bless us, and he's not going to be able to help us, and we won't be able to stand in a situation like that. But if we have truly repented of our sins and have um, found that assurance from Christ, then we'll be able to. Thank you. 
Hey, Amen. And, you know, you brought in Judas. Judas would have been forgiven if he would have repented and turned to Christ. He would have been forgiven also. And who knows, we could have seen the same kind of power from him, the same kind of boldness. But yes, Peter recognized the love of Christ for him, the forgiveness that he was granted, and that really turned his heart towards him. And it, it, it humbled Peter a lot. Because when we see when Christ asked him, do you love me? You know, that's a whole nother sermon in itself. But it was first, do you love me as much as all these? Oh, no, I'm not going to say that. Do you love me unconditional? I'm not going to say that. Do you love me like your brother? Well, yeah, you know, absolutely with that. So, you know, Peter wasn't willing to be so bold about himself any longer. But now he was definitely being bold about Christ. Yes, Donna. I just wanted to ask Pastor Stump a question. Based on what he said a while ago about Peter, that nobody mentioned, you know, when he stood up to, to preach, that he had denied Christ. But why was there a difference with Paul? You know, they feared Paul and they, they kept bringing up, bringing up his past that he persecuted the Christians and whatever. Why do you think there was a difference with him? Paul was a, a member of the Sanhedrin. He had been a recognized Judaism where Peter had never had that kind you're, of You're Paul. breaking up on this, Not because I'm doing the best I can. I'm sorry. I'll try to speak slower. Let me turn my video off. That may help. Maybe if you just have audio, it'll transmit better. But but actually, I don't know that Paul, you see, Paul wasn't really well loved, even by many of the professed Christians. Paul was considered by many an apostate, and they didn't trust Paul very much. Many of them didn't. Whereas Peter, they, he was one of the original 12, and there was no need to have this same kind of attitude toward him, I think. Thank you. Yeah, and, and with Peter also... Jesus expressed not only to Peter, but to the group, and then even in the midst of the group with Peter directly, they were able to witness Christ's forgiveness of Peter, and that Christ still included Peter in there. And although Peter denied Christ, Paul had gone about killing Christians. and. They hadn't seen anything with Paul yet to, to change their understanding of who he was and what he was about. And so there was that reluctance. But as Paul began to preach and get out there and share Christ with others, you know, that changed. That changed with him as well and, and people's attitudes towards him. Yes, Royals. Uh, another thing that I'd like to add to that is that they all ran. So basically everybody was guilty of denying <laughs> yeah. him. So it would be complete hypocrisy for anybody to accuse Peter, to single out Peter. And yes, Paul went out of his way to kill Christians. He actually wrote letters to um, get authority to go and hunt out the Christians and kill them. Whereas Peter didn't have that. So, or Peter did none of that. He sought self-protection, whereas Paul was a hunter. So that would be my answer to that question. Mr. Yolene? To this, we must add, Paul had to go to his own trial while he was tested by Christ and losing his sight. He had to stand and prove himself to recognize that he wasn't the great because he was in the army. His job was to accomplish a mission. He was doing what he knew to do best. But when Christ came to him and faced him by asking, why, why are you persecuting me? Right there, he understood that there were a vault of fast that was supposed to be done. 
And he acknowledged it and did it with humility, if we can say, because he accepted that he was not doing the right thing. Okay. All right. So now back to Peter and our lesson. <laughs> you know, here, Acts chapter 2, verse 22, as Peter begins preaching, the very first thing he does is to show really the authority of Christ, why we should accept Christ. What is it that he says here? What was the authorization Christ had? Why should we believe Jesus to be anything more than just a man? Yes, Brother Rob. In verse 22, it says, He men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as he yourself also knew. So it is saying Jesus was a man approved of God. Okay. And, hey, I don't know if it's you or donovan that put up the lesson that we're in but that actually looks to me like it's the end of lesson two and we're actually doing lesson three here yeah that that's what he starts out with is jesus of nazareth he's a man approved by god so he's not just some person who showed up on the scene and trying to prove himself even but by all the different, as it says, miracles, wonders, and signs, this showed God's approval. But notice what it says here, too. It doesn't say Jesus did all these things, that it was his power, his own authority, or anything else. But look at what the end of verse 22 says, which God did by him in the midst of you. So if, although they saw Jesus as the one performing them, Peter's making it clear, oh, no, this wasn't just him doing it. It wasn't based on who he is and anything about him. This was God actually working through him, which we also have scripture, and I can't think right where it's at the moment. 1 Corinthians, I believe it is, 15, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And so, you know, here Peter is establishing that same kind of idea that the Father was in Christ working these things, working these miracles, these signs, these wonders. And so this shows the calling of Christ, the that he was sent by the Father in order to do these things. That this was God reaching out to you and I. Yes, Yolene. Yeah, we must not forget that uh, it is from the beginning of the world that uh, the Father always spoke to his son. From creation and on, that was the work that was being accomplished. The Father spoke to his son and everything were made. Right? Yes, he did. And yes, scripture tells us that the Father created all things through Christ. But what Peter is saying here, we, we see the same thing spoken of through many other scriptures. But this is to... You know, like I said, to start with, they believed in God, but it's like, who is, who's this person? And, and they've had many false Christs, many false messiahs. And so many of the times it was people coming to stir up war and rebellion, just wanting release from the civil authority type things. And here we're going to see that Christ comes and does much more than that, 
but that's what they're looking at. And so, and many people, because Jesus didn't come to deliver them from the civil authority, they're wondering, is he really the Messiah? And Peter is making this case that, yes, he really is. He was definitely sent by God. And as we, we look at verse 23, you know, he established Jesus as sent by God, approved by God, God working through him. And then he says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. I don't want you to miss the center of that verse. The outsides, Peter's saying, you know, you've taken him, you've took him to the council, you decided to slay him, you crucified him, but look at the middle of the verse. It wasn't just he was delivered by the determinate council, but also the foreknowledge of God. This was not something that happened without God knowing what was going to take place. God didn't send Jesus and then say, oops, I wasn't counting on them to be that mad. I wasn't counting on them to go to that extreme. No, he knew ahead of time this is what was going to happen. Jesus came for the purpose of dying for us. And God knew this was going to happen. He knew how to handle it. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a lack of foresight. God knew what was happening. If the father knew it, the son knew it too. He, he told him what was going to take place. And yet they still chose to go along with this plan for the sake of you and I. One moment, yes. brother, I'll just say something. And based on what, verse 22 as well, just to go back to verse 22, who better to, to say this than Peter? Because remember that when Christ had asked, who do men say I am? And Peter was the one that said, you know, the son of the living God. And mm -hmm. who was it revealed by it? The father. So who better than Peter to, to say he was approved of God? Good point. Thank you. And so now, verse 23, we see that, you know, Peter tells him, you took him by your wicked hands, you crucified him, you killed him. But, verse 24, God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be beholden of it. And that that last part, that he should be beholden of it, that it should grab hold of him, that it should keep, keep him in his grasp. So this is saying God raised him up because death wasn't going to keep him in its grasp. And, you know, when we look at this, we see very plainly, it says that it is God who raised him up. And, you know, in the past, I've taught that Jesus raised himself. I mean, Jesus said, you know, you destroy me, I will raise myself up. I've taught that. But scripture is very clear, and not just here, but many places, that it is the Father who raised his Son. And this is one of those places. And it's having loosed the pains of death. You know, I look at that, and they say they're the two greatest fears of people in this world is public speaking and death. And I can tell you, as far as public speaking goes, I can, I, I'm a testament that God can deliver us from that fear as well. I used to be deathly afraid to get up in front of people and say anything. Now, if I could kind of hide in the back and run my mouth, sure, I'd do that. But to get up in front, oh, no, uh-uh, no, never. Now, since God called me to do it, he's given me the ability to do it. He's given me the courage to do it. 
I have no problem doing it. On rare occasions, there's an issue. And when there is, I kind of get scared because when there is that issue, there hasn't been for so long that I wonder why is there an issue with this now? And I wonder, am I not trusting God to, to be with me right now? And so that kind of scares me, but it's not because of getting up and speaking. It's just, am I trusting God at this time or am I kind of leaving him behind? So with that, you know, like I say, I'm personal testimony that he can deliver us from that. But the second, the other great fear that people have, the fear of death, God's proven that he's got power over that as well. We don't have to worry about death. He showed with Jesus Christ that he's got power over death, even death. I mean, what other thing has such a great hold on anybody other than death? What is it that we know so little about other than death? And, you know, if we'll read the scriptures and accept them, we'll understand what death is. That death is like going to sleep and being in a deep sleep. But most people don't want to accept that. Even most Christians don't want to accept that. And so with that, there's can be all kinds of confusion about death what it is, what happens, you know, where we go, everything else. But God has answered that for us, but also said, you know, he has power. Not, he Not only the ability to explain death, but the power to deliver us from that death. And, you know, one of the, the great ways people today will, and not just today, but I think probably all through the life of man, one of the great controlling factors they have is do what I say do or I'll kill you. And people are so afraid of that, that they'll do things that they wouldn't do otherwise. You know, we know we don't have to fear death. And even if they should kill us now, all that means is we rest until Christ chooses to resurrect us. So we should have no fear of death whatsoever. And so death should have no pain for us in any way like this is talking about. He is not only was Christ loosed from the pains of death, but we have been loosed from the pains of death because of being a, a witness. And although we were not eyewitnesses because we believe that he has been resurrected and the father has shown that power over even death yes jonathan and mary amen and then we know that god didn't even come down himself from heaven to come and get his son he provided the power the life-giving power he raised his son but he sent gabriel to come and get him and said Gabriel said, son, your father is calling you. And he came out of the tomb. That to me is amazing how the father and the son both make use of the ministration of the angels. But we know that there's only life in Christ himself because he got it from his father. And then his father is the one who's got life-giving powers. But as to say, if God would have come down himself uh, with anybody there being present, everybody would have ceased to exist. Amen. Amen. And just for those who may not know, the statement that it was Gabriel that did that is not found in Scripture, but it is found in the Spirit of Prophecy writings. And so that's where Mary is getting that from. But, you know, and whether you choose to believe that or not, it still shows the power of God over even death. He's the giver of life. He's the giver of new life. If he could create life in the beginning, he can give life back to us. 
And so that's what we're seeing. Yes, Sister Kaz, welcome. Oh, thank you and Sabbath blessings, Brother Rob. People, I think the statement shouldn't really be, am I afraid of death or am I afraid of dying? Because basically I've spoken to some persons about it. We had a discussion and they were saying death is dead. When you're dead, you know nothing. So they're not really afraid of death. They're actually afraid of dying. I mean, the actual act of dying, how one day. So when we look in the world, we may see, you know, they're torturing people. Even the discussion of how Isaiah died, that's not scriptural, but some persons may have it to say that he was sawn in off. It is how you die. I think people are really afraid of. John was boiled in a pot of oil because they want to kill him in the most cruelest way possible. Christ was hung on the cross. And when we think of how they chose to kill Christ, there was no support for his stomach, for his ribs, for his middle part. You know, so he had to heave himself up. And then the pain that was ripping through his shoulders and his arms. So what people basically are afraid of, I believe, is how they are going out, like how hard is the suffering, how painful it is. So basically you will hear people say the dead is dead, the dead knows nothing. Though that is for those who believe the scriptures which says the dead knows nothing. And there are the others who believe that when you died, you go to heaven. So basically there are persons who are not really afraid of death, but it is when you see the wickedness happening in this world and how some people are being killed, are murdered, are tortured until they are dead. You know, that's what I believe people are really afraid of. And so you will find people praying, Lord, help me to have a peaceful hand. Help me to die peacefully in my sleep. And so basically I think that's, that, that's the whole concept of people being afraid of death. I, I will agree that is part of it. I've definitely come across people that because they don't understand what death is, they're afraid of being dead, not just the process. But the process, yes, can be much scarier than the fact of being dead, because who knows how we're going to die. The examples you brought up, such as, as John being boiled in oil, well, after that had happened, it, it didn't kill him. It didn't harm him. And that's why he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. We also have in scripture where, you know, Daniel was thrown in the lion's den for them to devour him. That didn't happen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown in the fiery furnace so that it would consume them. Well, it killed the people that threw them in, but caused absolutely no harm to the three of them. And so we see within scripture and then also history, we can look at all the different martyrs. Well, I shouldn't say all of them, but many of the martyrs where they're being burned at the stake singing hymns. They're being torn apart in different ways, killed in different ways. And yet they're praising God at the time. They, many of them, they willingly go to their death suffering whatever act of violence it is that they must go through for the sake of Christ. And yet they go through this willingly. They go through this praising God. They go through this without any fear because all this shows us that not only does our God have power over death, but even over life and what happens in life, and if he so chooses, he can keep us from any of the pain that we might otherwise suffer through the process of death. We have nothing to fear from anyone outside, period. I mean, God does not let anything happen to us that doesn't go through him first. And that he doesn't have power over. 
And if we will remember whether it's the process of dying or whether it's anything else, any other trial in our life, that everything we go through is an opportunity for us to glorify God in his name, then that will make it much easier for us to go through everything, even the process of dying to the point of death. Yes, Elaine. Yes, I just wanted to add that fire purifies the soul that we have to remember. Fire purifies the soul as we see gold being purified in the fire. And for us to see death, we have to remember who will take care of us. Christ is with us. If we have the faith of Christ, the faith of Christ, not the faith in Christ, the faith of Jesus who trusted his father, that nothing faded to him, nothing make him afraid. He was standing fast in front of everything, knowing that the father had his soul in his hand. So we have to remember the faith of Christ is what we need to go through the fires of this life. Yes, absolutely. So here we see that the father has raised up the son Peter's testifying that is what actually took place. And then he begins to speak to us about David. And starting in verse 25, he says, David speaks concerning him. And the him that he's talking about here is Christ. And basically what he's saying here is David prophesied this in the book of Psalms. And this comes from Psalm 16. He says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And, you know, when you read this in Psalms, and knowing it's written by David, it sounds like something David may be talking about concerning himself, and that he recognizes, basically, that God is on his side, and, and God is going to take care of him, and 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 God is going to take him through all these things and do it, you know, make him with joy as his countenance. And, and so, you know, regardless of what I suffer, he's going to give me joy. It can look like this is what David is saying. But then Peter says, verse, verse 29, starting there, he says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. David wrote all this stuff, but let me tell you what's up with David now. Unto you that he is both dead and buried, and his grave, his sepulcher, is with us unto this day. So he's saying, David spoke all these things, but let's look at David for a moment. David is still dead. He's still in his grave. His grave's still here with us. If, if we open it up, we can see his bones in there. We can see that he's still there. He says, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did seek corruption. So Peter's making it clear here that what David spoke about was a prophecy about Christ and his resurrection. And Christ was going to be this seed of David who was going to be on the throne forever. And even though he was going to die, God was still going to raise him from the dead. He would not see corruption. 
Now, you know, it's, it says here in verse 31 that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Try and think kind of how to word this. Hell is not what most people think of when they think of hell. You know, the Bible has a couple different words, three different words, really, in the New Testament that's translated hell. You got Hades, Sheol, and Tartarus. Tartarus means the, the deepest depths, and I think that's only used once. Hades, which is the one used here, simply means the place of the dead. Well, what most people do is take the place of the dead and turn it into Sheol, which Sheol was actually the, the garbage dump outside of Jerusalem where everything would be burned and be consumed. And the, that's how they took care of all their waste, was burning it. And that's been used as a symbol for the final destruction. And what people are doing is too often is taking the two usages, usages of the English word we of hell and combining them together and saying that the place of the dead is this fire, burning fire. If we look through scripture, we see, again, that the burning fire is the destruction of the wicked. Just the same it was the destruction of all their waste stuff. It's the destruction of the wicked, where it said that they turn to ash. They'll be stubble under the feet. They become nothing. Whereas Hades is just the grave. And in, in 1 Corinthians, again, I think it's chapter 15, Pastor Allen gave us the verse for the other that I thought was 15. It was 2 Corinthians 5.19 that said that the Father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But Paul also speaks, oh, grave, where is thy victory? And grave there, that word is, the Greek word was Hades, the same word that is here. So was that talking about a, a fiery burning place? No, it wasn't. Is that what this is talking about here? No, it's not. It's talking about the grave. There is nothing to say that Christ went into this fiery pit somewhere when he died. He didn't come back out and say that he did. No one else who ever died in, in Scripture has ever come out and said that they went to some fiery pit or that they went to heaven either at that time. And we know Jesus didn't go to heaven because after his resurrection, he told Mary, don't detain me for I have not yet ascended to my father. And so we know he didn't go there. And so, you know, to say that he would not be left in hell simply means it's a prophecy saying that although the Messiah was going to die for our sins, he wouldn't remain dead, that God would resurrect him. And that's exactly what Peter's telling us through here. And now, why is that important for us? Why is it so important for us to know that Christ has been resurrected? Because this shows that he has conquered death and he is able to keep that promise that we will actually be able to see him and in heaven because we will be resurrected as well yeah almost every one of us is going to die yes. yeah some people say all of us well there will be some who are alive during the end who will never face death like like elijah and, and enoch never actually died and yet they got translated to heaven there will be a small group like that but all the rest of us, we're going to die. Is that the end of all things? No. God has proven that he has power over death, even the death that Christ died. 
you know, which was the death for all sin. It was the penalty of sin that he paid, and yet he was resurrected from it. It shows that God has not only power over death, but he's got complete power over sin as well. If he's got complete power over sin, can you think of any reason why we should continue in sin? Why sin has any dominion over us? If God has power over sin and we're surrendered to God, then he's got the power over sin in our life as well. He's defeated sin. We don't need to continue in it any longer. Yes, we're still in a sinful world, but we do not at any point have to sin. It has no power over us whatsoever. Yes, Elaine. Yes, I was going to say the sinful flesh that we carry will not let us go without until we give ourselves completely to, to Christ. Un until we give the self and humble ourselves to Christ for salvation, the sinful flesh that we carry will be a burden for us. Yes, it will. Unless we're, like you say, unless we're surrendered to Christ and we rely upon his power and what he's done, yes. Andrea. Yes, Rob. As, as you're speaking, you know what was coming to my mind, because verse 32 says, this Jesus hath God raised up. We are all witnesses. And it takes me back to Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So it's just really telling me, we, we talk about following the example of Christ. I mean, Jesus is the image of his father. I want to be like Jesus. So it's just really reinforcing to me, if you have Christ in you, then God will also raise us up when we die. As you spoke, that, that just came to me. All right. Yeah, as long as we're going to believe this, believe that the father raised Christ, then we have hope we th there's nothing for us to fear because the greatest power of sin is death the wages of sin is death sin separates us from the father but if if the father can overcome all that jesus died for sin he paid the penalty for it he showed his power over it and not only the presence of sin but the power of sin the, and the penalty of sin then we have nothing to fear and should we die we have that blessed hope that just as the father raised christ from the dead that we will be raised from the dead as well and this is what peter goes on to say here Andrea read verse 32 for us that this Jesus has God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Now, you and I are not eyewitnesses of that account, but we choose to believe the account of the eyewitnesses, and we see the power of God in our lives, which is what he goes on to say, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. So Peter's going back to, you know, all this that you are seeing, that you're hearing, where all of us are speaking in these different languages that you know, this is the power of the Holy Ghost. This is the Father gave it to his Son. The Son has shed it upon us. And this is able to happen because he was resurrected. And he wanted to make it clear again that it was Christ that David was talking about because he goes into verse 34, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he, he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. So he's making plain here 
David is not talking about himself. David is dead. He's buried. He's in the grave. He has not been resurrected. He is not in heaven, which flies in the face of what so many people, so many Christians do believe is that right when you die, you go to heaven or hell. Well, David, a man after God's own heart, Scripture tells us he's going to be in heaven. God had declared him to be an, a righteous man and, and all this. David, we're told very plainly here, he has not ascended into heaven. Now, to many people, if David's not in heaven, that means he's in hell. But that's not what the scripture is talking about. It's letting us know David's still in his grave, and who David was talking about in his psalm was not himself, but Jesus. And look at verse 36. I, I want you to really understand verse 36. Let all the house of Israel, which that's you and I, that's not just those who are of the lineage of Israel, but Paul tells us that those of us who are of the belief of Abraham, those of us who trust God, who take God at his word, we are Israel. So this is speaking to us. Let all of us know assuredly. We can be fully assured. We do not have to have any doubt whatsoever that God made this same Jesus Lord and Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the deliverer from our sin, but he is also to be the Lord of our life. We are to look to him and follow his leadership. We are to have the faith of Christ. The way Christ believed the Father, trusted the Father, we're to do the same. And we see that Jesus had done that. We're to do that. It brought death to Jesus, yes, but the Father resurrected him. It may bring death to you and I, but we have nothing to fear from that because just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we be. Yes, Donna. And, and you know, Rob, as I read this chapter, I know it is very repetitive, you know, saying that the Father is a son. And that's what I'm not understanding why a lot of persons will be seeing Christ raise himself. When you spoke of that David was talking about Christ, and then when you look at verse 25 and you compare it to verse 32 and 33, you see that it's really the father and the son. Because when in reading it 25, we'd assume that David was talking about himself. Of course, you know, it's a David is dead and not ascended or whatever. But when I read 32 and 33, it's kind of more clearer. It says, therefore, being by the right hand, after it said, this, it, this Jesus hath God raised up, he said, therefore, being by the right hand of God. Because it would appear as if David was talking about himself and Christ is at his right hand. But then it made clear that he was talking about his father. But, you know, back to this thing that, you know, this Jesus only, because as I tell you, I've studied with some Sunday worshipers, and they are saying that Jesus raised himself. I think he's only one. And you mentioned it, one verse that Jesus was saying that, you know, he has a power to raise himself and whatever. Of course, you know, receive and to give. There are some difference there. But just to know that the word states over and over again that the father raised his son. And persons are, so if Jesus raised himself, was he dead? Could not have been dead then. And, you know, there, there are so, because some persons are saying it was like a human sacrifice. And here you are seeing that his soul was not left in hell. But his soul. That's more than the body. There are so, it's good that we can study, look at the word and not add to it. Or take away from it, but read it as it plainly states until maybe there is some other revelation. Because sometimes you read it and it seems clear, but there is something is because I might not read it in context, or there are other verses that might shed more light on it. So it's so important that we start to show ourselves approved. Amen. 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 And that 
what you're saying, study to show ourselves approved. So often we believe what we believe because we heard somebody else present it and we accept their study. We don't do it on our own. Then too, even when we study on our own, we read into the verses what we want them to say and not just look at what they do say. And I think both those things happen a lot, especially with death and going right to heaven. That happens a lot. Us understanding this teaching, we can see how many other people are reading into scriptures or refusing to look at certain scriptures just neglecting them, we can see that real clearly. But that puts a major challenge on you and I. And what that is, is that we don't do the same thing with any other scriptures. I mean, hey, we can call them out on this, absolutely. But if we're doing the same thing on any other subject, are we really any different? We're not. And so whatever condemnation we might put at them because of it, we're putting that same condemnation on ourselves. Judge not lest ye be judged in like manner. Whatever manner in which you judge others, you will be judged. And so, you know, it doesn't say don't judge and just drop it. It's letting us know that how we judge, we're going to be judged that same way. And when we condemn people for doing something, and then we turn around and do the same thing in another area, we're heaping that condemnation upon ourselves. And so, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. When we have an understanding of what's going on, it's required to us that we don't give in to that same type of thing that we hold ourselves to a higher standard in everything makes it tough but that's also where truth really comes out when we hold ourselves to that standard and we make sure we follow the principles that we want them to follow here then that's going to help us have a better understanding of scripture and through a better understanding of Scripture, a better understanding of God. So here we are, you know, Peter wanting the, the, this sermon that he gives here. He's really wanting the people to understand who this person is that they just killed. That it wasn't just a man, but this is whom God had sent. God sent him for our sin, to be crucified for our sin. God knew this was what was going to take place. He sent him for this purpose, but God at no time meant for him to stay in his grave. And he even prophesied this through David and made it clear that David was not talking about himself, but talking about Christ. and. They saw Christ walk this earth. They heard him teach what he taught. They saw him, him put to death. He was put into his grave. The disciples and many others saw him resurrected. And not only him, but others who had been in their graves prior to that came out of their graves now and went about the cities so that they can be a testament to the power of God over death. And it's not just that he died and was resurrected, but notice what he says here too. Verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. So Jesus had been exalted, put at the right hand of God. And then in verse 34, he tells us that David even talks about this. For he said himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand. The, the 
a plain translation of that is the father said unto Jesus, the, his son, sit on my right hand. I have raised you from the grave. Uh, you have ascended up into heaven. Now sit on my right hand until I make your foes your footstool. And we can be assured that God has made this same Jesus our Lord and our Christ. That is the Christ who we love. That is the Christ who we serve. That is the Christ who directs us to the Father who loves us just as much and we're to serve just as much and we're to know them both, not one or the other. As so many generations of people, it has been one or the other. God's message for us today brings us back into union with the both of them. And that's where we should be today. And that's what we need to share with others. Not just the love of the Father, not just the love of the Son, but the love of both for you and I. And how both want us to be one with them and spend eternity with them. Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you for being the God that you are, the God who loves us so much that he would send his only begotten son, even knowing what he was going to suffer, even knowing he was going to have to die, he was going to pay that penalty for sin. But we thank you, Father, that even with all that, and with all you would suffer seeing what he had to go through, that you are such a powerful God that you have overcome death. You have proven that. And not only the death of your son, but the death of the rest of us. Even though we have not yet died, we can be fully assured that death for us is just asleep and we will be resurrected to spend eternity with you. Father, help us to hold fast to this. Help us to never let it go, to know that because of this, that whatever comes about in our lives, it needs not have any power over us. For you have defeated all evil, all sin, and the power of all sin. And therefore, we can trust you for this life and for eternal life. We thank you for this, Father. We thank you for holding us fast and pray that you will help us to never let go of you. So we pray these things through the power and the name of your Son, Jesus, as well as through your power in your name. Amen. 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 Amen.